<clears throat> Boy, you guys work a fella when he comes up here. <laughs> uh, we're not done, are we? But that's great. What a great opportunity to um, present a couple of lessons tonight and three in the morning and then two on Sunday. I'm looking forward to all of these with you. I do uh, next month, actually the first week in November, I'll be in Arizona and uh, I'll be presenting we're going to be working through James and on Friday night I'll have two lessons and then on Saturday I have seven. So this is nothing compared to that. And on Sunday I'll be dead uh, after that. But it's a great time together, people coming together to study the Word. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, salvation from the perspective of knowing Christ. And I want you to turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And uh, again, here's the Apostle Paul that is now writing to the church in Philippi. It's a great letter. I, I want to just read the first 14 verses and then I'd like to point out some things that I think will be relevant for us. He says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it's a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcise the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law a Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish in order that I may gain Christ mm -hmm. and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on in order that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now this is a passage about knowing Christ. It's a passage about Paul saying, I want to know Christ. Mm -hmm. And that may sound a little strange because by the time he wrote this, he's been preaching Jesus for some 20 or more years. And you would think in all of that time, he would have come to understand Christ and to know Christ. And so I think if we want to comprehend what Paul is saying here, we're going to have to come to an understanding of what it means to know him, to know Christ. Now I want to begin with verse 1, and we're working our way through the text a little at a time. And so Paul begins with the word finally. 
Now, beware when a preacher says, finally. <laughs> He's got two more chapters to write. So if I say, in conclusion, you got another two hours before I'm done. Finally, he says, and then he says, to write the same things uh, again is no trouble to me. And so you can preach the same sermon, can't you? Paul is just reminding them of things. But he says to rejoice in the Lord, and all of us need to be doing that. And, and to uh, have in our hearts and our minds the idea of joy in our relationship with Christ Jesus. He wants to safeguard them, he says. And that just means to protect them from uh, outward opposition. And what's coming their way are false teachers. Now the way he describes them here in verse 2 indicates that these men are what we would call Judaizers. And maybe you've heard that term. It's a term that we use to describe the kind of false teachers that were influencing the churches over in Galatia. The Judaizers were people who were raised as Jews but they heard the gospel and they were baptized and they called themselves Christians, but they never fully let go of the law of Moses. They brought certain aspects of the law with them and they went about teaching the Gentiles that they had really to become Jewish in order to be Christian. And so Paul fully deals with that in the letter to the Galatians but he keeps running into that problem wherever he goes. It's almost as if these Judaizers are following him wherever he goes to preach. You see it in Colossae. You see it also in Corinth, especially in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And now you're seeing it here in the church in Philippi. So he begins by saying, you need to beware of the dogs. He's talking about these false teachers. Now I know that the Apostle Peter must have been from Texas because he uses the word y'all, you all, six times in this book and now he says beware of the dogs. Every self-respecting Texan owns a pickup, a rifle, has a gun rack in the pickup and a dog to ride up in shotgun in the front seat. Beware of the dogs. Now, he's not using the term dog like Jesus did when he was talking with the Syro-Phoenician uh, uh, woman. And he said to her, who she was seeking help from him, and he gave this sort of parable. He said that it's not good to take the food from the children, meaning the Jews, and give those, that to the dogs, meaning you know, the Gentiles. But he, he's not using the word dog in a derogatory manner there in Mark's gospel. But rather he's talking about a little, a little pet that would be like a part of the family. It would jump up in your lap and you'd name him Fufu. That's the kind of dog. But here Paul is talking about what Jim Croce sung about in the 70s, a junkyard dog who shows his teeth and he slobbers and his name is Killer because this dog wants to devour you. It's the false teachers. He says, beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers. These guys are not lazy, they work hard, but all of their product is evil because if you follow them you're going to be led into a false religion not into the righteousness of Christ so you beware of them and then he says beware of the false circumcision you see they were advocating that the Gentile men had to be circumcised because that was the sign of the covenant that God gave to Abraham and the only way you can become a son of Abraham, they thought, was by participating in that physical element of circumcision. But Paul says that's false. And then in verse 3, he brings the Christians in. We are the true, the real circumcision. 
And that is not of the flesh, of course, but it's a spiritual circumcision where we have cut away from the heart the evil that is there and we're trying to follow the Lord Jesus. We worship in the Spirit of God, he says. And I think Paul may have in mind John chapter 4 when Jesus was talking to that woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. And you remember that, Paul, or that Jesus said there, that God is spirit. And those who are the true worshipers worship God in spirit and truth. And so it's, it's so unlike the old covenant worship, which was really kind of a physical worship. You had to go to a physical city, Jerusalem, and a physical temple to offer physical sacrifices and all of those rituals, but what we have are spiritual sacrifices that we offer to the Lord. And the Hebrews writer in chapter 13 says it's the fruit of our lips. And so we worship in keeping with the very nature of God who is spirit. And then he says we glory in Christ and put no confidence in the flesh. And what he means by that is these Judaizers that are coming, they glory in their accomplishments in a physical kind of way. They believe in law keeping. They believe that you cannot be saved by Christ only, but you actually earn your salvation by keeping the rules and regulations and rituals of law. And when you have a religion like that of keeping rules and regulations, you're going to glory or boast in your accomplishments. But Paul is saying the only thing that we genuine Christians boast in, glory in, is Christ and what he's done for us. And we never in any way boast about our accomplishments in the flesh. And then Paul says... But, but these guys want to brag. They want to boast. And if they want to boast, I can stay with them. In fact, I can out-boast yeah. them. And I think that, that Paul, you know, doesn't like doing this. It's repulsive to him. But sometimes you have to put people down. There's an old saying, um, if I could just think of it, <laughs> uh, about uh, you uh, can't win an argument. Uh, no, how does it go? I don't remember. I'm having a senior moment here. <laughs> You'll have to forgive me. But it's the idea of it's repulsive. It's something like uh, you can't win a puking contest with a vulture. That's what it is. I finally got it. And that's what Paul is engaging here. But look what he says. If you want to compare pedigrees, he's saying, let me just show you what mine is. I am a true Israelite. He says in verse 5, I was circumcised the eighth day. That was by law. Some were not. He says that I'm of the nation of Israel. He's a true Israelite of the tribe of Benjamin. I think that's significant because they took great pride as being the tribe that brought forth the first king, Saul. And so there's a lot of uh, glory going on in being of that tribe. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, which means both parents, grandparents, all the way down the line, they're all full blood Jews. Mm -hmm. and there's no Gentile in his ancestry. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law of Pharisee. Now, folks, the Pharisees were sticklers for the law. And so here's a man that was intent in learning the law, teaching the law, following the law. And then as to zeal, he's a persecutor of the church. Mm -hmm. In fact, in Galatians 1 verses 13 and 14, he was so zealous in all of this, he wanted to destroy the church. And that was his intent. 
That's how zealous he was for the law. He was more zealous than these Judaizers would ever think about being. And then in the law, he was found blameless by anyone that would judge him. They would say he was about as righteous a man, keeping the rules and regulations of law better than anyone. Now, that's what Paul used to be. That's what he was after in religion when he was a Jew and following the Jewish religion. He was after everything that would elevate him, everything that's held out sort of like a carrot stick that you would reach for. That's what he wanted. It's exactly what he doesn't care anything about now. But the Judaizers are coming and presenting those kinds of things to these young Christians in Philippi. Now Paul says that all of that is worthless to him. He counts all of that as a loss. He considers all of that to be rubbish in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. <coughs> what does he mean by knowing Christ? I want you to hold your place here and turn back to the prophet Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1. I'll give you just a little time to find that. It's on page 720 if you have a good Bible like mine, which Moses brought down from Mount Sinai. Somebody said, Orbison, I've heard you say that. And he said, don't you know that Moses broke those tablets in two? I said, yes, that was the new international version. He went back up and got the new American standard and brought it down. <laughs> I just wanted to see if you were listening. Some of you have, uh, are not or have no sense of humor whatsoever. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm struggling here just a second. In Isaiah chapter 1, we have this expression or this word that God uses in reference to his own people. This word, no. Listen, if you will, to the accusations that God brings against his people, beginning at verse 2. Listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth, God is bringing the heavens and the earth in as witnesses. <coughs> the, for the Lord speaks, sons I have reared and brought up, but they have revolted against me. An ox knows its owner, and a donkey its master's manger. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. What is God saying there through Isaiah? He's using that word no to mean that a donkey has a better relationship with its owner mm -hmm. than my people have with me. He's not talking about information in that sense of knowing. He's talking about having a personal, intimate relationship with him. And the way they're living their lives indicates that they really haven't got a clue about God. They don't know him. In verse 5, or excuse me, verse 4, alas, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons who act corruptly. They have abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned <coughs> away from him. And so they don't really understand him. As he goes on, he describes, thank you, brother. You're my new best friend forever. <laughs> we'll have to meet afterwards. I haven't met you yet. He talks about the whole uh, nation is like a sick person. Then drop down to verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Now he's not talking about the ancient cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. He's talking about his own people. He's calling them Sodom and Gomorrah. 
Because they're not living to his standards. They don't know or understand him. Verse 11, what are your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord. Wait a minute. Didn't you command us to give those sacrifices? Well, yes, God did. But now he doesn't want them. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. And I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? In other words, they're going to church every weekend. They're going down to the temple and they're offering those sacrifices. And they never miss one. They're just trampling the courts, going to church. But every Monday, they go back into the world and live like the world. Mm -hmm. In verse 12, or 13, bring your worthless offerings no longer. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the solemn assembly. And then he keeps going on from there. Here are people who think of God in this way, that as long as I get myself to church and go through the rituals, I'm tight with God. But I can hardly wait till church is over so I can get out there and really enjoy life in the way that I want to enjoy life. You see, they really had no clue about the God who created them and the God who saved them and chose them to be his sons. They do not know God. There's no real relationship there. And so in back, back in Philippians chapter 3, when Paul uh, says, I want to know Christ. He's talking about, I want to know him on a personal level, on a personal basis. I want to know him. And there are three things that he mentions here that sort of put us in that direction of how we come to know Christ. And he says, first of all, that I count all things as loss. And he's using bookkeeper terminology. In, on, on a ledger sheet, you have gains and losses or debits and credits. And Paul is saying that he counts all things as loss. Whatever was at once important to him, all of the prestige, all of the material things, all of the glory of the here and now, he's written that down on the ledger as a loss. Mm -hmm. Do you have a nice home? Well, it's okay to have a nice home, but just write that down on the loss column. Mm -hmm. And then if a hurricane blows it away or a tornado or you lose it through some other means, you haven't lost anything, have you? Because you already wrote it down as a loss. Mm -hmm. Do you have a nice car? It's great to have a good car, but you need to write that down as a loss. When my son went to college a few years ago, well, it's been a, quite a few years ago. Did I mention I'm only 39? I just <laughs> want to make, anyway, he took my pickup with him to college. And I tell you, I really missed my pickup. And I sort of miss my son too, but I really miss my pickup. And my wife said, what are you moping around here for? Why don't you go out and find a used car that you can drive around town? And so I did. I found a 1973 Chevrolet, Stingray, Corvette. And my wife had the same reaction. You what? <laughs> and it was kind of beat up, but I restored it. And it's a beauty. But it means nothing mm -hmm. to me. Oh, yeah. I've already written that off as a loss. 
I don't care if I lose that. Because none of that is important in view of the surpassing value of the relationship that we need and should have with our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, secondly, I count all of that as rubbish. Now that word rubbish is an interesting term. It's the worst kind of garbage that you can imagine. Many years ago, about 35, I was uh, living in Texas and preaching in Texas. And on a hot August afternoon, I mowed the lawn and I had collected grass clippings that filled two of those black plastic bags. And I had picked up both of them and I was headed across the parking lot. We live right next door to the church building. And I was going across the parking lot to the alley where there was a dumpster there and I was going to throw those in. I was about 50 yards from the dumpster when the odor hit me coming from that dumpster. It was amazing. And so I decided, well, I got to get rid of these. So I just took a breath, a deep breath and ran to throw those bags in there. But I was so curious to know why it smelled so bad that I looked in. You've had your supper, so this is okay. On one end is where there, there was a, an old tire that somebody had thrown into our dumpster. And it had, they'd left the lid open. It rained a couple of days before. There was stagnant water inside of that tire. Next to that was all of the decaying vegetables, you know. There were shriveled tomato peels and, and uh, banana peels. And it, it was just terrible. And then on the other end was, if you can believe this, someone had put all of the, their kids' dirty diapers in our dumpster. And that's where all the flies were. It was horrible. If you had thrown a hundred dollar bill in there, I wouldn't go get it. That's how bad it was. I'd throw my son in after it, but I wouldn't go in there and get it. Now, would you ever reach over into that dumpster and pull something out and take it into your house and put it above your fireplace on the mantel and, and be proud of that and say, look what I have. Paul says that's the way he sees everything about this life and this realm. It's just rubbish mm -hmm. in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, mm -hmm. our Lord, having that relationship. One other thing he says about knowing Christ here is what he says in verse 10 that I may know him, the power of his resurrection. He's not there talking about his experiencing on his own the resurrection. He knows that's to come. But he'd like to experience the power of the resurrection. Here Paul is talking about walking in the shoes of Jesus. To experience the things that Jesus experienced because that's how you come to know someone. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine knowing the power of the resurrection? You would not be afraid of anyone if you fully experienced that power. It would give you the courage to stand up and speak for Jesus and not be fearful mm -hmm. right. of any repercussion that you might receive. Because you know you have the power over death through Christ. He goes on to talk about experiencing what Jesus experienced, the fellowship, the fellowship of his sufferings. Mm -hmm. And that word fellowship means to share in common. I want to suffer like Jesus suffered. 
Because that's how you come to know Jesus. And then he says, I want to be conformed to his death. That word conformed means to be molded in the same shape. I want to experience, to understand all of that. I think when you stand firm for truth, I think when you speak out for Christ, you're going to be experiencing the suffering that the Lord himself experienced. Mm -hmm. And you're going to come to appreciate Jesus in a way that maybe you have never experienced before. Because you know that it's, it's the truth. And as you experience what he experienced, you come to know him. Have you ever analyzed your relationship with other people? I sat down one day when I was studying this passage and thought about all of the acquaintances that I have. And I, I realized that I have different levels of knowing people mm -hmm. and relationship with them. And so I, I could divide them all into three different categories. One is what I would call a superficial relationship. These are people that I see, you know, on a regular basis. It might be like um, a lady down at the post office. I see, you know, every two or three days when I'm down there. Her name, I know, is Yolanda. I know she has some children, but I don't know their names. Mm -hmm. And I know her mother is, is experiencing some difficulty because she's told me that. But we don't have a real relationship with one another. I call her Yo, and I walk in and say, Yo, Yo. <laughs> and then I want to crawl under the counter when people don't respond well to that. <laughs> but I don't really know her. I just don't know her. I used to go down to coffee every morning at, and when I lived in Texas, a small town. We had one restaurant. It was called Dairy Queen. Maybe you've heard of it. Mm. And I'd go down for coffee, and I was there every morning and studying my Bible and just spending about an hour there drinking coffee and, and working on different things in scripture. In fact, the, the lady who ran the Dairy Queen at that time was uh, enamored with that and, and she'd have my coffee ready for me as soon as she, she saw me pull up in the parking lot. It would be at my table, hot and ready to go. And one morning, I had forgotten to put some money in my wallet. And I said, Robbie, uh, I, I don't have enough money for the coffee. I'm 10 cents short. And she said, well, that's okay, guy. I'll come down and take it out in preaching. I'll hear you preach. That'll be worth 10 cents. I said, Robbie, I don't have any 10 cent sermons. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, you don't? I said, no. And she said, okay, I'll come hear you twice. <laughs> Now, there are some relationships that you like to keep superficial. <laughs> I don't really know her. I know some things about her. I think the multitudes that followed Jesus had this kind of superficial relationship with him. They weren't really interested in getting to know him. They liked what he could provide for them but they never really came to a relationship with him. A second group that I have is what I call developing relationships, and these are people that I'd like to know, I'd like to develop a relationship with. When I was still living in that town and preaching there, it was Clyde, Texas, Roy, uh, where I preached for many years, and we had a great ministry there. There were only 1,200 people in the town, 
and our congregation grew to 400. Mm. A third of the, the town was in our building every Sunday. It was a wonderful ministry. There was a dentist in town who liked to play golf, and I played golf, and so we, I wanted to get to know him, and he took Fridays off, and so I would take Friday morning off, and we'd play golf every Friday because I wanted to know him. His son was five years old, and my son was five years old at the time, and he came to me one Friday, and he said, Guy, uh, I've been checking about the Pee Wee League baseball, and my son Ben wants to play Pee Wee baseball, and I think Josh would probably want to play, but they said you have to be six years old, and, and our boys are only five. But they said if the father coaches, then the five-year-old could play. And Ben said, you know, I'm not much on baseball, but I bet you are. And so if you'll coach, I'll be your assistant. And I said, okay, I will, because I want to get to know this guy. And so we coached these little six-year-olds and our two five-year-old sons. And I can remember it so well, all of the experiences that we had together. And one night when we were playing, one of our guys actually got a hit. He hit the ball. And it went through the shortstop. The shortstop was ready like this, and the ball went right through his legs. In fact, I remember he bent over and waved at it as it went through. <laughs> and I thought, my, we have the opportunity to actually score. And so he ran to first base. Bill was coaching first. I'm coaching third base. And I'm yelling to Bill, Bill, send him to second base. And so Bill says, go to second, go to second. And the kid said, where's second, coach? <laughs> We'd never been there before. And so he pointed that bag down there. And so he ran and jumped on second base and just stood there. Now I'm looking at where that ball is. It went out into the outfield, and I'm looking at the, first the right fielder, and that kid is laying flat on his back looking at the cloud formations. <laughs> so I know he's not gonna pick up the ball. The guy in center field is chasing a butterfly. <laughs> he's not gonna pick up the ball, and the guy in left field is picking a bouquet of dandelions for his mom. And so I begin to yell, go home. And Bill says, go home. And the crowd are yelling, go all the way home. So the kid did from second base over the pitcher's mound <laughs> to home. He didn't know we had third base to go for. Now, Bill and I experienced that, and after that, we talked about that and laughed about that for a long time. You see, when, when you experience things with people mm -hmm. like that, it sticks with you. Mm -hmm. And you get to know that person. I think this is where the apostles were in their relationship with Jesus. You see, they were in a developing relationship. They wanted to know Christ. They had information, but they really didn't know him, did they? Because they would talk about things like, who's the greatest in the kingdom? And the sons of, of Zebedee came to him one day and say, and said to him, sit one of us on your right hand and the other on the left hand when you come into your kingdom. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm going to drink, they asked, or Jesus asked. They said, yeah, but they didn't know. And the other ten became indignant because they were jealous of the two. They just didn't know. Will you now restore the kingdom to Israel? The last thing they said to him before he ascended. They just really had not come to that strong, mature, personal, intimate relationship with the Lord. They didn't know him. 
but they wanted to. Mm -hmm. A third group in which I have acquaintances is what I call the personal and intimate relationship with people. And these are people that I, that, that I know all about them because we've been through a lot together. You see this kind of relationship in, in good marriages. And uh, I, I've been married to Mary for 47 years. And what a, a joyful adventure we've had in life together. You know, I'm one of the few preachers that can say that his secretary has sat on his lap. <laughs> now be careful. My wife has been my secretary for most of the years of my ministry. She knows me. You know, she can take a phone call and she can say to people, no, I don't think he would be interested in that or volunteer me for something without even saying anything to me because she knows me. We have that kind of close relationship. And the Apostle Paul is saying, I want that relationship with Christ. Mm -hmm. I want to know him. And so he's willing to walk in the shoes of Jesus. He's willing to experience what Jesus experienced so that he might have that kind of relationship with his Lord. Mm -hmm. There is salvation in no one else. Paul knows that and he seeks that. In the 1950s, there was a man by the name of John Howard Griffin who wanted to know what it was like to be a black man in the South in the United States at that time. He darkened his skin and he got on a bus and rode through the South to see what life was like. He was told, you'll have to go to the back of the bus. He was told, you can't drink from that water fountain. He was told, you cannot eat in this restaurant. And he began to realize, I think for the first time, the plight and the prejudice that existed in our country at that time. And he wrote about his experience in a book entitled Black Like Me and his relationship with a black man was never the same because he knew, he knew them. In the 1980s, there was a young industrial designer by the name of Patricia Moore. She was in her late 20s and a, a very attractive woman, but she wanted to know what it was like to be among the elderly in our country. And so she learned how to fix her hair and makeup, and she learned how to dress and to walk like a woman in her 80s. And so she wrote about the, the kind of treatment that she received. For example, she went into a retail store as a woman at about age 85. And she talked about the abuse that the manager had given to her. And then she came back to the store as herself. Mm -hmm. And he could fall all over himself trying to help this woman. And she began to realize that there's a kind of pressure and persecution of the elderly in our society. And she wrote about that in a 1985 book entitled Disguised. And her relationship with the elderly changed forever because she knew them. She knew them. And when God wanted a relationship with man, his creation. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And he experienced everything that we experience as human beings. 
He was hungry. He got thirsty. He felt the struggles of having to, to live under the uh, watchful eye of a holy God. He stood at the graveside of a loved one and wept. He experienced the pain of suffering and the fear and pain of dying. And his relationship with us was never the same because he knows us. And the Hebrews writer says that he's able to come to our assistance, able to come to our aid because he has walked where we walk and he knows us. And so Paul is telling the church in Philippi, that's what I want. I want to walk in the shoes of Jesus that I may know him. And he's saying that there's nothing in this world more important. And when you see what God has done for us, when you see that the most important thing to God is our salvation, mm -hmm. that he would spare nothing in saving us, then surely we would desire to know him mm -hmm. through his son, Jesus Christ. Paul says there is nothing in this world that is more important than this one thing. It is a personal intimate relationship with Christ. Amen. Do you know him? Mm -hmm. Do you know him? Jesus. Tonight, we're calling upon people to come to know Jesus. Mm -hmm. It begins when you're born again through baptism for remission of sins. We invite anyone to come who may have need for any spiritual reason to come and get their life right with the Lord while we stand and while we sing Amen. song selected.